Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to the to today's uh, SIG. Um, today we have uh, an interesting one going. Uh, for once, you're not going to listen to me. You're going to uh, we're going to introduce uh, Ron Prader, who's one of our uh, supervisors, shift supervisors, and has um, although he's been uh, working on his home for many many years and doing all the kind of things that homeowners tend to do, um, he's come to woodworking as a craft slash art form in, in, in just in recent years and I'm just stunned by his talent he's he's um, he, he, he's uh, he's a physicist by profession and, and, and training and uh, he's got a really I, I really love his his little um, stool that's uh, that also in the shape of, of pi the mathematical constant that uh, I use in in, uh, in my work you know in my woodwork occasionally um, but anyway, I'm, I'm not going to waste time with, with, with me, but I'm going to introduce you to Ron and he's going to show us his furniture and talk a little bit about how he integrates uh, hand tool work into that. Okay. Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, glad you're here. Um, I, I'd like to stay at the outset that uh, this is not a brag um, presentation. My thinking is that there are a lot of really good workers, woodworkers in the organization, in the member shop, um, that have done lots of good stuff that we never see. I never seen. And so what I'm hoping is that this will sort of start off a new, uh, uh, a new uh, system where, where people can show what they do and, um, and other people can, can get ideas from that. Um, so I've also been asked how I got into woodworking and I think it's, it's kind of, of, of uh, interest here. So I'll, I'll briefly describe that. I came to San Diego about 40 years ago, a little more um, for, for my work, which is nuclear fusion. And my job uh, in nuclear fusion is making things hot. And by hot, I mean around 100 million degrees or 200 million degrees. And um, that takes a lot of power, it takes a lot of stuff, it takes a lot of equipment. So if I have an idea for how to do that, well, then I have to go um, present the concept to the group. And if they, they like it, then um, I do a, a study it for a while and then I do a physics validation review. And if they like that, then I start doing a, a, a conceptual design review. And then there's a design review and then there's a fabrication review and I wanted to be able to go home and do stuff and build things and have no reviews. <laughs> and that's, that's how I got into woodworking. Um, also, we needed things around the house. Um, so I'm going to try to go into screen sharing now. Uh, you have to enable my screen sharing. Uh, Mr. Host. Yep, give me one second, sorry. Okay. It's in the bottom under the security uh, sections. While he's doing that, Ron, um, did you ever singe your fingers on one million degree anything? A uh, hundred million. A hundred um, million. <laughs> no, your fingers don't get too close to it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and by the way, um, during this presentation, if you have questions, I hope I, I, I would really like to address them during the course of it. So um, if the, the moderator can interrupt um, verbally, with a question that's been listed, because I can't see the chat box when it's on screen sharing. Why not describe that lovely that. bench that you've got while you're there? Oh, I will. Uh, <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> uh, so, Ron, Ron, the audience is uh, small enough of nine of us that if you don't mind, maybe we can just interject when we have a question. Rather That'd be fine too. Uh, okay, great. As long as we don't get too much crosstalk. That, that okay. Ron, you should be you should be okay to, uh, to share your screen now. You don't have a wife review? <laughs> um, no. <laughs> I start working before the, before the wife review. <laughs> uh, 
Okay, then I do. Okay, can you see that, that okay? Yes. Okay. Um, so this is a pi chair that, uh, that Paul mentioned. Um, pi is the letter P in the Greek alphabet, and of course, has a lot of uh, significance mathematically. Um, and it's also the first letter of my last name. So I'll come back to that. Um, when I came to San Diego, um, it, it's interesting to think back, that was in the, in the mid 70s. And there was no information available on woodworking. Really, you, there was no internet, you couldn't get a YouTube video, of, you know, if you had some, some question, some issue. So, um, and there were no tools. If you wanted tools, well, you had to go to handyman and pick over what they had, and, and it wasn't much. And um, so that wasn't so, so useful. And, and getting wood was hard. Um, Frost Lumber existed then, it was downtown. And they had a, a magnificent selection of woods, much broader than they have now. Um, but when a nerdy guy in a uh, physicist costume comes in at lunchtime, they were closed on the weekends, um, and, and asked for a couple of sticks of red oak, um, they, they were less than fully at attention, <laughs> I would say. Um, but you could get things. So I, I decided to take a class um, at Torrey Pines High School. And it was an evening, evening class in their industrial arts division. And I needed a project. And so this was my first ever project. This is a coffee table that's still in, in daily use. Uh, it's made out of poplar. And uh, this uh, project taught me how difficult it can be when you have a, when you're making dovetails to figure out where you have to trim uh, in order to get the pieces to fit. It, it really uh, took me a lot of time. But I made another one of these uh, later. This is, uh, I, I found some um, sort of bird's eye copper. And the difference was uh, now I knew how to get use a Japanese back saw. And that made a tremendous difference because you could cut a line and you could stay on the line and it was straight and uh, made things much simpler. So this is, uh, this is right off the saw. And you can see that it's close to fitting already. Um, and I never could have done that with a, a Western saw. So maybe it's just my limitation, but anyway, this helped a lot. And the other thing was I read in one of the Cranoff books that, <laughs> you know, he was a fussy guy, James Cranoff. And um, he was kind of against jigs of any kind. But you have to cut all these, uh, uh, the waist out of these dovetails on a straight line. And he said that a, a clamping of a straight edge across it is okay. So anybody that's beginning dovetails that uh, is, is wrestling with this, James Cranoff says it's okay to do this. Um, then we had kids. And um, this is a chair that I made for the kids. Um, it's made out of uh, pine. Uh, one by 12. And uh, it, it's a really nice design. The kids really like it. There's a seat here that you can stand, you can sit on, you can stand on. There's two levels. It's not in the middle. So one level is higher than the other. Or you can put it on the back and, and stand on like that. So you can get to the kitchen uh, sink, you know, to help cook or, or the bathroom or uh, wash your hands. Really worked well. It's made out of four boards. Um, the seat goes into the stato here, and then these uh, ends slide over the uh, the ends of the uh, the ends of the seat uh, as, as a sliding tapered dovetail. So in the end, there's no no need for any fasteners. Uh, there's only a little bit of glue on the dovetails to keep them from uh, keep them snug, and uh, those are a nice, nice design. So when we're on the topic of pine, this is uh, another topic completely. Um, this is fairly recent. Uh, and this is at the Torrey Pines Botanic Garden. And they had a Torrey Pine tree blow down. 
and had been cut into logs and left uh, to waste in the, in the to be chipped pile. And uh, this fellow and I, um, and, and he was very important because he owned this, this portable mill, uh, cut these into uh, boards and we, we put the boards, uh, stacked the boards and that didn't work so well. And so I, I've been learning a lot about that. Um, we, we covered it with a tarp, but the wood started to split and so on, and it was drying too fast. So I brought some of them home. These are three of the pieces. These are 16 inches wide, eight feet long, and four inches thick. And they were wet and heavy, and I could just barely pick up one end of each. And then I noticed um, frass from uh, boring insects. So I knew I didn't want those boring insects infecting the whole house and the garage and the rest of the wood. So I constructed this uh, coffin and I put the, the piece of, uh, of, of each board in the, in the coffin and put it in a hairdryer. And I had taken the hairdryer and disabled all of the safety mechanisms on it, like uh, over temperature and overcurrent and all that. And over the course of 14 hours of running the hairdryer, the center of that wood piece got to 140 degrees, which is what the Forest Service says is good enough to kill everything. And that seemed to work. So then I could work the wood. I had to let it sit for about two and a half years after that. Um, but pine dries fairly fast. So here I'm, I'm uh, decided to make this one into a bench. And the idea was that this is kind of curved ar around this way. So a person sitting here, and a person sitting there are not really, oops, excuse me here, are not really facing away from each other. It's just, they're sort of angled toward each other. It makes a kind of a more comfortable bench, I think. I was using spoke shaves here to smooth off the edges and, and, and the back. Um, Uh, why is this happening? Okay, so then I took some other boards from that same tree and made these into um, uh, the legs. These are the tenons for the legs. This is the, uh, the mortises in the bottom of the bench. And this is a diagonal also made out of that, that same board. Nice. Yeah, thank you. Glued it up like this. Um, and uh, then after a lot of work to finish it, uh, came out like this. Hmm. And this, uh, this bench now sits in the conservatory at the, where all the visitors uh, come through for the uh, San Diego Botanic Garden. And Absolutely. I think it makes kind of a nice welcoming idea. Absolutely. Okay, but I had two, two of these boards uh, more left over, these four inch thick ones. So I made these into um, a table. This is our kitchen table now. And um, I added these, these uh, keys, these, these uh, butterfly keys, because you can see the, the pith of the wood is right here. And so it kind of split along the, the pith. And I'm hoping that the, uh, the keys will act to permanently hold those cracks from, from proceeding. Uh, People joke that, that this uh, slot, this hole in the middle is where you throw the broccoli when you don't want it. <laughs> it's a trestle table. You can see here's the, the end of the trestle and there's a pin that holds it together so it becomes disassemblable. Uh, the base is made out of, uh, oh, okay. So I had to cut the ends of these, uh, cut the ends of these uh, pieces, but I, I didn't have a beam saw. My skill saw wouldn't go four inches to cut it. So I clamped um, straight edges across and then put the router into a, a, a kind of a base here and then ran it back and forth to, to get it straight. Uh, and that worked, that worked quite well. Um, the base, I had some 16 quarter poplar and uh, I knew I needed a thick solid looking base. It wasn't that heavy, the tabletop but it, it needed something that looked like it was really solid and, and invincible. So, um, I, so I made it out of, out of this material. 
I had to put a kind of a, so there's a cross piece here that the top sits on, and then another piece perpendicular to that, which was designed to resist racking. So if you pushed on the table, it wouldn't um, fall over. Uh, and then of course the trestle helps with that too. Uh, this is a bench. I've made uh, five of these now for various family members. This one is made out of canary wood. And I made the, the, the legs are joined by double mortise, double tenons into the mortises in the bottom of the top. And while it was still in six inch uh, widths, I bandsawed these out and then joined it. And then of course, you, you, know, you really can't bandsaw exactly. I can't anyway. And so things didn't match. And so it was a whole lot of work uh, with a card scraper, a spoke shave and sanding disc and so on to get this to, uh, to join smoothly. So anyway, I wanted to, to, to expand on this a little bit. And so I made the thing that I put into the design and wood uh, contest last year, uh, this uh, stool here. Huh. Uh, it's a very similar concept, um, except I wanted this pummel in the middle and I had seen Maloof joints and I wanted to make Maloof joints and try to understand how they, uh, how they worked. So I started with a blank of walnut. This is sort of the first things I've ever done in walnut. Um, and uh, glued it up and, uh, oops. No. Yeah. So I glued it up and then uh, clamped a uh, straight edge across, perpendicular across the table saw, and then pushed the blank through um, with a miter blade running here, and uh, uh, a dado blade uh, running here, and that cuts out a kind of a circular piece. Yeah. And then I moved the uh, the uh, uh, the fence a little bit and do it again and move it a little bit and do it again, each time flipping it end for end so it, became, so it was symmetric. Uh, and, and by the way, you're not allowed to do this at the shop. Uh, <laughs> only in your own shop can you do that. And then it came, it came out really nice. This is just straight off the saw. And I was really thrilled to see these, these uh, grain patterns here that, uh, that I hadn't expected. Gave it, gave it a lot of extra interest. And then I wanted to remove uh, the back of the pummel, so obviously you don't want to sit on that. So I, I cut this out with um, gouges and, the, and then scrapers and made a, a kind of a nice comfortable seat. Uh, it was one of those things where I'd carve for a while and then put it on boxes and sit on it and then put it back and carve some more to try to find a, uh, how to make it comfortable. I had never made the Maloof joint before, so I started with a, a popular decoy leg um, uh, uh, and, and saw that I could make it everything that would fit together. And then I came to the really hard part, which I, I know Dallas knows uh, and, and many others, is how you carve away the wood on the leg in order to make it join smoothly to the top of the, to, to the front and the top and the bottom of the uh, seat. And that was a lot of work. Um, and I tried lots of things, um, started with gouges and then uh, grinders and sanders and uh, a lot of work with uh, rasps. But anyway, it, it finally came out okay. So I was, I had some leftover walnut. Oh, well, so, so the top, um, so these are the handles and I bandsawed these to shape and then started uh, carving away the wood with gouges and uh, eventually ended up with something like that just with, from gouges and rasps. And then the thing was matching was this, this red circle here. So I glued it on before working on that and then uh, worked on that with, uh, with uh, hand grinders and rasps and uh, that was a lot of work too, but it came out really nice, I think. So I had some leftover walnut, so I decided to make uh, uh, this, this living room uh, table. And a friend had given me this, this, this 
top of it. Um, he'd said it was a uh, redwood burl, but didn't smell like redwood when I worked it. And um, didn't, didn't look like redwood to me, but so I'm not sure what it is. But the base I made out of uh, walnut, each, each leg is, <coughs> each leg is three pieces, one down here I joined by dominoes to a vertical one, and then by dominoes to a, another one. And before cutting these to, to length, I ran this across the table saw and, and cut a straight, a straight piece here. And then I flipped it over and cranked the, the table saw over to 30 degrees and cut a, a slice off the, uh, the, the, this edge and then flipped it over and cut another one. So 180 minus 30 minus 30 is 120 degrees and three times 120 is 360 degrees. So they all fit together uh, okay. like this. Very nice. And uh, then there was a lot of work with spoke shapes and, uh, uh, and, and then rasp and then sander. Uh, anyway, it, it came, out, came out the way I'd hoped. Ron, how, how long did it take for that portion of the project to be done? The, the legs? Yeah. Uh, not very long, actually. It was, it was not too bad. It took about um, three days, maybe. Oh, okay, great. Yeah. I was kind of surprised myself. <laughs> um, this is the top. Um, the, 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 actually, one of the hardest part was getting the top flat because it was a 20-year-old uh, piece of burl and it had um, warped quite a bit. So there was a lot of hand planing work uh, followed by a lot of belt sanding work. And then I had to learn how to fill uh, with epoxy to, to uh, fill in the voids. But it, it came out nice, I think. So I had some leftover walnut from that, and we had a, an easy chair. And hey, I, Ron, Ron, how many leftovers did you end up rolling in from one project to the next project? <laughs> Just long never, enough. Of <laughs> <laughs> never enough. Um, but I, I was really happy to have it. Um, and we had a, anyway, we had an easy chair, and we wanted I needed a place where I could just put a glass of wine or a beer um, next to it. So I call this a drink table, and and the top of it is perfectly square and perfectly rectangular sides. Everything was was uh, normal. Uh, the base is perfectly square, and then it kind of melts into this um, uh, this uh, kind of. Organic. Melted look. I was trying to make it look like it had melted. Yeah, it's a cool effect. Uh, I'm not. I'm not very happy with this one. And for, for example, I had to make the bottom thicker, and I spliced in this this piece here, and the coloration of it is different, and it kind of ruins the the, the flow. I think. Mm -hmm. But it was fun to do. I learned a lot, and one day I'll, I'll remake it. Ron, great I'm contrast. I'm willing to take this terrible piece off your hands. <laughs> <laughs> um, he needs a place for his beer and wine. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, so being a physicist, I, I thought about this as melted space. Um, and so I started thinking about, well, what else can I do with space? And you can see, so this is kind of a, a pattern here, which I tried some various things uh, just with plywood to, to get an idea. But I, one of the things I came up with sheared space. So mm. this is one where the top is, is rectangular, it's perfect, recta perfect square, and the bottom is a perfect square, and the, and the pedestal is a perfect square. But yeah. everything is tilted at a 15 degree angle from this edge and from that edge. The side of a trapezoid, yeah. What? Trapezoid. Uh, yeah, so the edges, the edges become kind of, kind of like trapezoids but because yeah. they had Two, they're tilted in two directions. So it's, it's not exactly that. Um, Got it. it looks like if you put your, your beer over here, the thing's gonna fall over, but it's not the case because I, I moved the base over a little bit toward this corner and it's actually, it's quite stable. And, uh, and I really like this one. Yeah. And so I was thinking, okay, now I've got shared space, what else can I do? And so I thought, well, Twisted space. 
Oh, neat. So this is the same idea. The top is square and the, and the pedestal is square and the bottom is square and the pedestal is square. And in between it takes this 45 uh, degree twist. So this was fun to make. Ron, when you're roughing this out, when you're roughing out the, the stem there, are you just taking cuts and stopping somewhere in the middle and then using like a planer or something to, to kind of wrap that wood around, so to speak? Uh, what's your process there? Yes, yeah, that's an interesting question. So what I did was I made a mathematical formula from this, which was just a sine square. And um, I, I took a, uh, 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 pieces of plywood. I made a cradle on the table saw and I, so I knew the angle and I put a dado blade on the saw and I knew that the angle I wanted to make for each, each longitudinal location. And I took one of those little angle um, measurement devices and, and I rotate it to that angle, put it across the dado and then move it longitudinally and then reset the angle and do it again. So this became a, a bunch of steps. And then I used a uh, spoke shave after that and then rasp. Was that clear? Yeah, it sure was. I appreciate you sharing that insight. Okay. Um, so then like many of you last March, um, everything got shut down and I didn't want to go to any lumber yards. So probably like a lot of you, I asked myself, what can I make with what I've got? So I had this, Hondur this Honduras mahogany board. And so I squared it up and cut this uh, uh, bevel along the edges, a kind of chamfer. And that tended to lighten it up substantially. And then put it on this, this, this uh, uh, walnut base and a peg to hold it in place. Um, this was the last of my scraps though, by the way. <laughs> hey Ron, you, you had a series going there for a while where you were calling one the melted space, another one twisted space, another one right. tilted space. It sounds as though you had a series going there. Is this, is this part of that series or was the, was there just a period of time when you were trying to think about how maybe mathematically or geometrically, you could play with ideas and, uh, or is that just a continuing theme in your work? The notion of uh, playing with uh, geometric shapes and ideas of organic versus very square and, and contrasts. I mean, this is, this, is, this is lovely math in action right here, which we're looking at. Uh, yeah, this was kind of my idea of a kind of a modernistic table. Um, yeah. The balance really comes out as a feature in that thing, it really, it's really distinct. Did yeah. you have a name for this one? No. <laughs> no name? Okay. No name table. Um, so, so, uh, so how did I cut these, these, um, the slanted tapered mortise? Well, I cut an angle on the, uh, on the table saw, 42 degrees, and um, put it on a piece of poplar, made it the width of the pedestal piece, and then clamped it to the top of the- uh, Sorry. I'm trying to close it to, to, to the top of the uh, the board, and then use that to guide a chisel, so I could cut away the uh, the, the waste after I'd in the, in the gotten of rid of a lot of it through boring. And then on the other side, I used 48 degrees, and that made the ta the tapers. And then ah. I wasn't really sure how to. I, I was pretty sure that I didn't have the angles all accurate enough that I could just make it from design and have the top be level. So instead I made the top level using using a level and holding it in the in the tail vise. And then I marked a level line on the <laughs> pedestal. And I made the pedestal, the, the bottom of the pedestal to that line. And and that worked well. Yeah. So this is what the pedestal looked like. This is the hole for the, the, the sporting peg. And this is the uh, the rosewood pig uh, that went into it. Wow. Say, Ron, I got a question. Okay. Do you do any kind of like, I know you mentioned plywood for not jigs, but sample pieces. Do you use any other media like foam boards or styrofoam to kind of like mimic what the concept is before you start making sawdust? 
No, I haven't. Um, it would have been a good idea a number of times, but um, I haven't done that. Usually my, my modeling consists of putting boxes down with boards across it to see how high it should be and sitting on it or something to test the height, but um, I haven't ever used foam board or anything like that. Okay, thanks. Um, so talking about design, um, every once in a while something hits you and you got to do it. So I saw this, this canary wood board at TH and H and I saw this, this feature of the, of the coloration and I said, well, I got to do something with that. So brought it home and made it into a, a box. So this is the top of the box. And a number of things I, I like about this box. I made it so the top so that the, the, the top extends over the past the, the front edge and makes the handle. Um, I used rosewood um, spines to reinforce the miters on the corners. And the edges, the edges of the box were thin enough that I didn't find any way I could use hinges. So instead, I uh, used a, a, a one eighth inch uh, brass round that I pounded in from the outside, you know, through a board hole into the top, and that made the, the top uh, pivot. And it was a lot cheaper too. Um, and then for a surprise on the inside. Uh, somebody had given me a, a piece of burl of some sort, and I cut off a one eighth inch thick slice and put that to the inside. So it kind of made a, a surprise when you open the open the box. So back to the pie chair, um, I made the pie chair, so I had to <clears throat> had to make uh, the rest of the furniture <laughs> match. The pie chair, the pie chair was canary wood, so I made the bed frame out of canary wood. And uh, it's a really a shame because this um, canary wood was just gorgeous. It had red streaks and black streaks and cream streaks, but over the years it's all turned brown. And uh, it's still nice, but, but not like it was. Um, I was able to make a curve on this, this back on the top of the bedstead that matched the grain of the, of the wood and, uh, and it came out nice, I think. Beds have to be demountable, so this joint here is, is demountable. Um, this is the rail, side rail, and this is a through mortise, a through tenon, and the tenon fits into a, there's a slanted uh, mortise on the upright and a, and a slant on the bottom of the tenon, and so you push the, uh, the, tenon, the, the, the tenon through and then drop it down, and that taper, those tapers that are locked, and then you put this uh, rosewood peg in uh, to hold it down and, and keep it keep it straight. And had to make end tables. So these are also uh, canary wood. Uh, I wanted a floating top, um, but when I put a uh, when I made the top and put it on, it looked too blocky and square. And so I hand pined uh, a, a round underneath, which you, you can't really see, but it made the edge uh, appear a lot narrower. I think it's like 9 sixteenths instead of 30, uh, the 20, 20, 25, 30 seconds that you usually get. And, uh, and made the, the piece a lot lighter and, and more warming, I think. Uh, these are the closet doors. Um, the, these are, these, these the, 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 each pair of slats was was um, a book matched and resawn. Uh, you can see, yeah. and the top and the bottom uh, extend, and so it was it was it was it came 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 across pretty nice. I think um, the hardest part of, of this was uh, keeping all the pieces straight. I mean, what's the top and what's the bottom and which way does it go, um, and and that took a, a some care. Since this the part was the idea that at some point you might move and have to leave that behind. <laughs> no, I, I've never considered moving. <laughs> I see. Okay. <laughs> uh, it's impossible now. Um, so the, the doors have to slide past each other so that the handles can't protrude. So this is how I made the handles. I carved away a, a half moon shape here uh, on, on each side and then 
used a, a, a gouge to, to make the surface more interesting. So I think that came, came out pretty well. Um, so this is the, uh, the, the bathroom in our bedroom. Ron, can I uh, just ask you a question about the, the joinery on that last piece? Sure. I noticed on, on um, if you, if, well, you don't need to go back a couple of slides, that, that ten, mortise and tenon joint that you made with the wedge there, was oh. that a, is that a, a, an Asian joint? I mean, is that a Chinese or a Japanese joint or is that something that you designed yourself? Well, I, I don't, people have been making things out of wood for 3,000 years. I don't think anything's original in woodworking, you know. You, Absolutely. So I, I, um, it was kind of my idea, but I, I certainly don't think that I originated it. I, I'm, I'm positive uh, <laughs> that it's, it's been in use, um, but uh, uh, <laughs> I don't quite know how to answer that. <laughs> I, th I think you've answered it okay. really well, yeah. Um, so first I made the, uh, the, 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 the cabinetry and these are purple heart panels in uh, red oak frames and purple heart drawer fronts. And I used again this, this cutting away, cutting away wood to make knobs rather than adding knobs that protrude and, and sort of catch on things you get in the way. Um, so after, after this was in place, um, I got to thinking it was awfully rectangular and uh, everything, everything was rectangle. So this was in the days when the kids were little and, and things had to be the way they came off the saw. So that's why. Um, so then I added the, uh, the mirror and the mirror has this, this, this nice curve on the top and it's supposed to imitate uh, the Japanese tori the, the, that uh, sit at the uh, gates of Buddhist temples. And that plus the, the protruding um, length here and a little bit of curvature and roundingness of the, the front sort of, I, I think, softened the whole, the whole aspect here. And then, um, we had Venetian blinds at the time over, over these windows and they didn't look out over anything particularly nice and people could see in if they were open. So we just left them closed all the time and so that wasn't so good. So then I made these, um, took advantage of the, the Japanese motif and made these um, shoji uh, Japanese style screens. Um, these are also <coughs> purple heart. They are, um, I think, five eighths of an inch uh, deep and three eighths of an inch wide. And where they cross, uh, like here, I used a half lap joint, and where they butt, a uh, dovetail joint. So there's a lot of dovetail <laughs> joints to, uh, to make this. Um, and it turns out that this is really strong. You know, you push on it, and it, it doesn't give it, even though there's no no piece that crosses all the way from one, one rail to the other top or top uh, or sideways. Um, it still is, it's quite, quite strong. And then I glued on this um, uh, plasticized Japanese rice paper and uh, it's lasted a, a really long time. So I've been, I was, I was really happy with this. This, this, I think worked out the way I wanted. And then this is the medicine cabinet again, uh, purple heart uh, 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 panels in, in a frame. So I was, for the rest of the talk, I was trying to think how to delimit what I show. I needed, I needed, I couldn't show everything. So, so I thought, well, maybe I'll show things where I used uh, purple heart for an important part. So that that's what I'm going to do. Um, this is a. Before you do that, you got some beautiful wood floor in there. Did you uh, yeah. have anything to do with uh, <laughs> the yeah, wood I that's in a, your flooring? Or <laughs> yeah, I laid all the floor. Um, it's all two and a quarter inch uh, strip, um, and uh, th in three rooms. I, I, I 
four four rooms. I, I laid all the hardwood floors. Wow, that's, that's you got some beautiful, beautiful flooring in there. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, anyway, your knees hurt after that, huh? <laughs> Pardon me. I said, I bet your knees hurt after doing that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> They, 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 so they have, I use this, this power nailer, it's called, but all the power comes from your shoulder. <laughs> yeah. um, so this, was, this is a uh, lectern that I made for my niece when she got married. Um, uh, this is a, a, another view of it. Uh, I learned a lot from this piece because I got out SketchUp and I made a bunch of drawings. You know, it's kind of a complicated piece. I made out drawings and, and I finally I came and said, ah, oh, that looks good. I'm going to make that. Um, and so I, I scaled out a leg and Dan sawed it and it looked terrible. It, it was so massive. It looked like the kind of piece of a furniture that you'd crawl under in an earthquake. Um, and so then I kept band sawing it smaller and smaller using various ways of drawing the curves until finally I got curves that I liked and then I reproduced those for the other, other legs. And um, so, so the point of that is you cannot just scale uh, uh, a, a drawing full size and not expect it to look weird. Um, the drawer front is, of course, is purple heart, and I, I managed to find a, a little bit of, once a little bit of grain showing, so I put that right in the middle of the drawer. Um, the sides are poplar, so I didn't want to have those go through, so I made a, a stopped dovetails. Um, and then for this shelf, I used the same uh, approach that I used for the shoji. This is looking down at it. Um, and you can see all these joints. These are all dovetail joints uh, everywhere here. And um, this also acts to keep the legs uh, vertical and, and straight. Uh, tissue box top. Um, this is kind of funny. I, I took the heater vents, which are metal in the house, and made them into these uh, uh, purple heart slatted oak pieces. So I, I think this is just kind of funny. Um, anyway, they work great. And uh, Purple Heart is a good, good wood for that because when you sand it sm really smoothly, it, it has no, no grain. And, and so the, the air, air could flow over it really easily. Um, this is a, a picture of the, of the stripping that I put in the flooring in most of those rooms. Uh, Purple Heart uh, going around, it adds a little bit of uh, a little bit of pizzazz, I think, to the to the floor. This is easy, of course. I put in the strip in the in the in the light in the light sconce, um, a, a strip of purple heart over the window valence, and I, I think this one is really funny. Um, the wand broke for the uh, for the Venetian blinds, so rather than get a new plastic one. Uh, I made this out of a sandwich of purple heart and um, uh, a, a red oak. And I left it fairly square on the bottom and then gradually tapered it up to a circular cross section near the top. It's, it's, it's nice to touch to, uh, to change the window uh, shades. If you ever want a uh, wooden necktie, I've got a couple. Um, this is a comb I made for my daughter. Uh, the teeth are purple heart with the grain going this way for strength. And then to keep it from breaking across the, the, the short grain, I added some Wendy uh, uh, strips along the spine. Uh, this is purple heart and maple cutting board. Uh, and then the workbench. So this, this, is, this is an interesting story. So, so when I started woodworking in the mid 70s, um, Fine Woodworking came out, and Fine Woodworking started, it started publishing in 1975. And I saw that on the newsstand, and I said, I, I'm going to subscribe to this. And, and it was a ray of light coming out of the heavens for me, because it had examples of beautiful work by, by, by many people. Um, 
it had advertisements for tool catalogs. So you send 50 cents to Woodcraft and they'd send you this paper catalog. Uh, and uh, uh, it was just, it was, a, a, it was wonderful. And about, so anyway, there are a lot of woodworkers there that I really admired, Art, Art Carpenter and Wendell Castle and James Cranoff. And one of them was Tay Free. I, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. He's a Danish maker. He's, he's uh, written several books that we have in our library. Um, but anyway, he, he really knew what he was doing. And in about the third, third issue, I think, he produced a, a plan for a workbench. And I thought, man, I gotta make that workbench. But it wasn't until years later I had the, the equipment and ability to, to do something like this. Uh, now, unlike most things in fine woodworking, this came fully dimensioned. Every piece, and there, there's like 50 pieces here, uh, every piece was fully dimensioned. And so uh, I cut all those pieces and I cut them all to dimension. And then <laughs> I started to assemble it and I couldn't quite figure it out. And finally, I just, I figured that the, uh, some of the pieces were mis misdimensioned. So I made them over and then it went together. And, uh, and I put the purple heart over the, the tail bench screw. And um, I found years later that, that Tay Fried had published a uh, erratum, the only erratum in, in, uh, in fine woodworking, I think, ever. And uh, uh, he, he called out the dimensions that I'd uh, mismade. Uh, Anyway, this, this is the, my favorite tool in my toolbox. It's so handy and so useful. And uh, I, I use it all the time. But one consequence is I've never ever made anything from drawing, dimension drawings again. <laughs> the only thing ever. Um, so I mentioned Frost. Um, in the 90s, I found this board at Frost. It's purple heart, it's 13 feet long, 16 inches wide, and uh, three quarters inch thick. And I said, well, I've gotta, gotta do something with that board, I gotta have it. And so uh, I, I got it home, wrestled it up into my overhead, over this is a, a, a lumber rack. And uh, since the wood shop is 20 feet wide, double, double door, double car garage, Getting a 13-foot board onto that was tricky, um, and and it stayed there collecting dust for for 15 more than 15 years. And then I decided to make a couple of doors out of it. And here's the doors. Uh, I just finished it so maybe a month ago. Um, these are three-quarter inch thick panels of of rosewood, and and the frame pieces are all uh, red oak. Uh, this this was was hard work. Um, the approach that I took was to make a dado in all of the the red oak pieces and tongues everywhere on all of the uh, panel pieces, and then gluing up uh, red oak to red oak. I put in a floating tongue. Uh, you can see a floating tongue here. And, um, and I glued these up one by one. I had to pre-finish the panels. So uh, I could only make one at a time and I glue this, this piece on, then glue this one on, measure this one, measure that panel, finish the panel, glue it all up. Anyway, it was a lot of steps. And intentionally I made it too wide for what I wanted. And so when I was done at, at this point, I ran the whole door across the table saw and that cut it to a uniform width and, and made all of these pieces, uh, uh, well, uni uniform across. And, uh, and, and then I added these other panels and then the glass style on the, uh, the latch side. This is, uh, so this is the panel. And I left about an eighth inch uh, reveal, a little bit more. Uh, 
between that and all of the oak pieces. And then these are the, uh, the handles for it. Um, this is the bathroom. I, I just want to note, finally, I, I made a little bit fancier uh, uh, for this bathroom. I made kind of barrel shaped um, uh, panels here, which actually meant a whole lot extra work, but I, I think it was worth it. They came out nice. The, uh, the mirror frame is Purple Heart joined by uh, a uh, dovetail, a big dovetail joint uh, here. And uh, uh, okay, I'm, I'm sorry that this, this picture is not, not too clear. And then uh, I've had these, these sliding glass doors for, for a long time and I put on purple heart pieces here. And the nice thing about this is that uh, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to touch these. Purple Heart gets such a smooth um, finish uh, that, that made it really rewarding to, uh, to touch. And this is another one. And I, I particularly want to, to show this one because uh, this used a technique that Garrett Hack showed us uh, in a special session at the shop following his uh, seminar, his fall seminar last year. And what it was, was he showed us how to use a, a piece of scratch stock, he called it, to scratch a groove in a piece of wood. And then you can put a contrasting piece of wood in, glue it in, and then you, you have a, a, a kind of a, a decoration. And, and I think it worked nicely. Um, but I think if I were going to do it again, I, I would. I made this this out of walnut. I would use something a little bit uh, darker or lighter, I think, and uh, a little bit more contrasty and uniform. I think it would have come out better. But so you live and learn. So um, the final topic, of just a few slides. We're getting close to an hour here. Um, the, the point I want to make in this part is that. All these techniques that we learn for making furniture can often be translated to exterior uh, uh, as well. So here's a, a passageway that I made, and the lintel I rounded off the edge and set it into the into a, a mortise in the uh, in the uh, well I guess it's a dado into the uh, the post and rounded that off. So it emphasizes the 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 different pieces of wood. And, and I think that gives it a little bit of extra interest. And uh, then I elaborated on that a little bit with the, uh, the gate. Um, here I used dovetails and dovetails here instead of, uh, instead of just straight, straight mortises. They're functional. They, they, they hold, hold the thing together. Um, I tapered this, this top piece on the bandsaw and then rounded it over with a spoke shave. Um, here's another view of the, uh, the, the top of it. And I had always planned that this rectangular space here, I would get somebody to make a uh, stained glass uh, artwork for, for it and put it in. But then, you know, with the pandemic and all, um, I decided I, well, I'd do something myself. So I made, uh, this, this piece instead. And uh, this runs almost continuously in, in, even in a light breeze and uh, adds, adds a lot of interest, I think. To, it's, it's a mobile? Uh, yeah, yeah, kinetic, kinetic uh, sculpture. And I bandsawed the pieces out of um, Western red cedar and then, then carved them a little bit with uh, spoke shaves. So I do a lot of spoke shaves. Um, this is a handrail I made in the yard and um, similar kind of thing. This is sort of a half lap joint here. And by uh, rounding it over, it emphasizes the disparate parts. So, so rather than just put a screw, th oops, a screw through uh, to the post, I use this, this arm. And I think it adds some interest. Now what, uh, we're getting near the end here, so, so <laughs> uh, don't, don't worry. Um, 
Nobody's worried, Ron. Take your time, Ron. We can listen to his great stuff. Um, anyway, I, I've been in Japan a few times and seen the, the temples there. And the temples are, you know, a thousand years old and, and, and holding up just fine. So I figured to uh, try to copy some of their joinery. So this is my version of what they might have done. Um, so this is a, a, a mortise cut in cut in a in a piece. This is a tenon, and this is a this point fits in into that. So the assembly looks like this. This is a, a square piece and a square piece, and then this is the, the diagonal. So I didn't have to use a wood a, a glue at all, and it supports a plant stand in the yard. So this is uh, this is that same that, the same pieces. And this joint is, is purely in compression, and the, the mortise and tenon keeps it from getting out of uh, out of plane. Mm -hmm. um, and then finally, um, this is a use of through through tenons and, and a mortise on uh, on plant stands. I made quite a few of these, and uh, uh, it's a very attractive way, I think, to, to support a plant. So that brings back to the pie chair and the end. So thanks, thanks for your attention. Wow. Hey, Ron, what, I mean, you probably have pictures of everything you've done because it looks as though you uh, basically take pictures as you go. What percentage of your work do you suppose we've had exposure to over the past hour? Uh, a lot of the things that I've done are in the form of uh, carpentry, and so I don't know whether you'd include that or not. Oh, uh, yeah. But including that, probably 20% or so. Wow, cool. Uh, okay. If you talk just about real woodworking, it's, it's more like uh, 35 or so. Very so something like that. Yeah. Um, have you ever done any steamed wood? No, I never have. Okay. I did make, um, uh, it's an interesting, uh, let's see, stop, share. If I can find my, uh, yeah, and just the reason I asked is that some of the, some of the pieces that you have I had initially thought that they were bent and uh, as opposed to sawn. So that's why I was that pondered the question. Yeah, I had to, I did one thing, I made a lamp where, where it was strongly, strongly curved and I used laminated, um, thin, thin laminations to bend that. I didn't need to use steam. Um, steam seems like a big, kind of a big deal. Um, but so I haven't, haven't ever tried that. Hey, Ron, you may have mentioned it in passing when you were talking about your bench that you have as your back uh, image. What is mm -hmm. your recessed area in the back for? For tools. Just a storage area, temporary storage? Yeah, so you put tools on there, but it's still flat, so you can put a, a, a piece across it and not, ha not have it interfere. Got it. And there's kind of a taper here on the, uh, on the end, so you can yeah. just sweep the sawdust out. Got it. Other questions, people? If you had, Ron, if you had a recommendation for a real, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm greener than a fresh cut piece of pine. <laughs> what, would, what, would you, what would you recommend as an entry to some of the cabinetry that you've been making and some of the doors and some of these very creative tenons that you've been doing? Where would, where would someone like me start? Well, I've, for, for 10 years or so, I've been taking, um, uh, I've been, I've been mentoring people that are just starting. Um, there was a, used to be a mentoring page on the San Diego Fine Woodworking Association webpage. They've, they've deleted that page now. Um, but anyway, I, I, a number of people had, had contacted me and, um, so depending on their, their skills and their background, um, 
when I'd uh, uh, I don't know. I'm afraid I'm kind of lost now. <laughs> uh, Ron, you might have uh, nine or ten people asking to you, you to mentor them. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Be careful. <laughs> yeah, I was I was already firing up the email. Uh, you know, I guess I guess a, a pandemic way to ask this question is until we can meet up and I can hug you for showing me how to make a cabinet, where can I start virtually first? Uh other than, you know, of course reaching out to you and dialogue. And I mean I can already imagine doing that. But uh, what can I be reading? What could I be studying or watching now to prepare me for the first lesson with you? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Okay, I, I had a phone call coming. I, I recognize it. <laughs> I love the joinery on that, those, and the idea of having those hand pieces to it makes it very functional. Yeah, yeah. It was it was it was a, a joy to make, and and I and I really like how it looks. Um, it's simpler than the real Maloof joint because the pieces are perpendicular and right. and upright, so it was uh, easier. Well, the, the rear leg, uh, the front legs on a Maloof is you know, straight anyhow on a rocker. Ah. And also on the side chairs are all straight. But that's a, that's a beautiful piece. Were you going to put that in the fair? I did put that, <laughs> yeah. That right. was an interesting yeah. phone call, wasn't it? <laughs> no, I, I did put it in the, in the fair. Mm -hmm. That was in, in design, in the last design in wood. Right. Ron, what project are you looking forward to doing next? Because it seems remarkably hard to be able to beat what you're doing already. No. Uh, I, I don't know. Actually, I've been, I've been starting working on the garden a lot. I've been um, become quite interested in, in uh, plants, new, new, new kinds of plants, uh, weird, weird plants, really. And, um, and spending a lot of time at that. Um, but I'm, I'm sure I'll, I'll come up with something soon. One thing maybe is is uh, is replacing this uh, doing, doing this one over. <laughs> it does bother you a little bit, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, it does. Are you going to go more Japanese style? Because you you seem to ex be excited by the, uh, the that that little bracket you made for the garden. It looked much too good for the garden. <laughs> <laughs> No, um, I don't know. I, I, I seem to be very eclectic. I, I, it just it just sort of happens. Um, I mean, this one and 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 this one couldn't be more different. Yeah, and, and I enjoy them both. And uh, uh, I don't know. I, it it. Uh, Sounds like you do what moves you. Yeah, um, I end up, honestly, I end up waking up in the morning thinking about, how, realized I've been, been thinking about things, uh, how, how to do something, how to solve a problem. Uh, used to be about physics, and now it's more uh, about wood. Um, so I think my subconscious has a lot to do with it. Absolutely brilliant. Well, thank you. I, I, I don't know if it's brilliant, but um, I, I enjoy it a lot. I mean, I, when I go, think, go through things, I always, I'm always thinking about things that I could do differently and better, like this one. I wish that I had made this, this back edge of this uh, top of the lectern curved to, to sort of mimic this curve. Um, didn't occur to me at the time, and it wasn't until I was finished that I, I thought that. So one of the things I always end up doing is critiquing myself. I always try to find, I always do find things that I should have done differently or better or uh, uh, would do again in a different way. I don't know about, about you guys, but um, one of the things I do often is uh, I do a project and I realize that 
that project would have been a lot easier if I had some tool. And so I go and buy the tool and then I never have another project that needs it. And so I have a number of tools that I've hardly ever used that uh, wished I'd had once, but, but now that I have them, I don't really need them. Well, there's nothing wrong with that though. <laughs> well, just a hundred bucks a throw, I guess. <laughs> um, so uh, any, anything else, um, Paul, that uh, was on the agenda? Here's another, uh, another thing that I made, a kind of a room divider. And um, again, this is purple heart, uh, purple heart shelf here, and purple, sharp, purple heart shelf here. Uh, just, just trying to liven up the room and, and separate a, a space that needed, needed separation. But okay, I'll stop. <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff, man. Good stuff. All right, now I've unmuted myself, so I, I, you can hear me. Uh, first of all, I want to say, Ron, a huge thank you for for um, presenting this to us today. It's been um, one of the most exciting uh, presentations we've had, and uh, I really admire the the way that you showed how just making a subtle change in the in the curve or putting a double taper on something can really lighten up and, and change the look of, of, of almost any piece. Um, I really admire that, and and uh, I'm I'm trying to learn it and and. Uh, I could just keep going on and on. So, well, thank you. Just I, I a huge thank you. I appreciate your your uh, your your appreciation, and uh, glad to be here. All right. Thank you, Ron. Well, thank you, thank you, and 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 uh, um, I think you, we're going to have a lot of uh, a lot of uh, views that happen after the after the event. You know, people looking at the recordings because because um, we'll see. <laughs> thank you very much, Ron. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye -bye. All right. Well, I just want to talk briefly about uh, what I intend to talk about next, uh, next uh, in our next session. Um, I'm going to try and talk about or try and get hold of a couple of the, the um, less common tools that, that are hand tools, such as uh, a score. I, I already have a... Um, I already have things like a a, um, a, a, a a Travisher, which I've been using just recently. You can see this 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 um, this, this uh, the black markings there. I've been what I've been doing is um, play. I Tom of uh, of Lumber Cycle gave me a whole bunch of um, of uh, barrel staves that uh, in order to make some uh, some gifts for our sale. And I've been working on those. And uh, one of the things that I do is is make a centerpiece, and that involves gluing two pieces of uh, barrel stave together, and then um, getting this in here. It, it's usually charred on the inside, but uh, but I use the travisher to smooth things up and to get things uh, back into a nice curve, and then and then then I burn it again. But uh, I I want to. Uh, to show off a few of those tools, and we'll probably do it from the shop where, you know, here's a, a draw knife is another traditional tool that, that, that um, can save a lot of time. It's like a, it, it's sort of like a, a free form giant spoke shave and uh, really nice instrument. Anyway, so that's kind of what I want to show off in the next session. Um, and if any of you guys, know of other woodworkers uh, of any discipline who, who uh, you think would be willing to present their work and, and you know their work and you admire it, then uh, please uh, feel free to contact us and we'll either put it on through this format or through another format uh, with San Diego Fine Woodworkers. But I, I, I'm just really inspired by what we've seen today. It's, it's um, I want to go out and write down a half a dozen things that, that uh, ideas that I've heard that I, that I want to use at some point. Um, but other than that, uh, I'd like to thank you all for checking in. And um, unless there are any further comments or questions for me, then I, I guess we'll end the, end the session. Okay. I do, I do oh. have one for you, Paul. Yes. 
Um, winding sticks. Do we have winding sticks at the shop? I don't, I've never seen something that's similar to the uh, to check parallelism and any kind of warp, minute warping of boards. Yes, you can very easily make them yourself. Um, all they really are is a, is a couple of straight pieces of wood, and use, And if you make them really nicely, you put a little contrasting wood there. I'll bring in, a, in, I use two different woods for mine. We don't have any in the shop, but if you'd like, okay. uh, like us to uh, put those out there, it would be a fun little project to make. Yeah, or just, you know, next presentation, show what you use for winding sticks to get better ideas of what works and what doesn't. Yeah, thank you. All right. All right. Do we have any other comments or questions, suggestions, insults, <laughs> rotten tomatoes? <laughs> All right. Well, I would like to um, say a huge thank you also to Lewis, who is our new producer and uh, has done a really uh, bang up job today. And uh, I'll be getting with him, I hope, in the, during the next two weeks when we try to improve the technology of our, our close ups and our audio in the shop there. But uh, anyway, thank you for checking in and, and uh, look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks. Thank you, Paul. Thanks for hosting.